But we're wrapping up the series today, the first OGs, and um, man, I'm so excited. This whole series has been about these original God followers of the Old Testament. And you look at the original God followers of the Old Testament, the reason why we study them, the reason why people talk about them in the New Testament is because they had something in their life that was so substantial. They had something in their life that was just, it was so attractive to other people. We have to go back and study them and find out what it is. If you look at David and Gideon and Abraham and Moses and Noah and Elijah and Elisha, you find that all of these guys had one thing in common and it was faith. Somebody say faith. Easy to say, hard to live, can I get a witness? Yeah. It's easy for us to say to other people, you just should have more faith. But it's a lot tougher for you to live that faith. And faith is believing more in what God says than what you see. Because your situation you're in might look dire, the situation you're in might look bad, the situation that you're in right now might look destructive, but at the end of the day, you gotta trust more in the fact that God is with you even when you can't see him and trust the fact that he has good intentions for your life. He's got a purpose for you, a plan for you, and it may not be your plan, it may not be your purpose, but it is his, and when you live God's way, it's incredible what he will do. And our whole theme verse for this series has been Hebrews chapter 11, it says this, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this this faith is the firm foundation. We just sang about it. It's just not great words on a page. It's the life that we live. The truth of the matter is that the firm foundation of our lives is built on the faith we have in Jesus Christ. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, the real OGs, the first OGs, and it set them apart from the crowd. Why? I just gotta be honest. Faith is attractive. Y'all ever been around somebody that, that was a follower of Jesus Christ and there's something about them, you just wanted to be around them more? You, you didn't really know what it was about them, but you're just like, man, I don't know what's up, but something. I don't know, like, what? because what? faith is attractive, man. Like, I just gotta be honest with you. When, when I first met Teresa, some of y'all heard the story, but she was a captain in the Air Force I was a youth pastor at a church. I had Wednesday night service. I, I taught the youth, and then Wednesday nights after they had Wednesday night Bible study and stuff, they would have the worship team rehearse for Sunday, and Teresa was singing with the worship team, and she'd come straight from Patrick Air Force Base, and she came to church in her flight suit, and I got out of student ministries and I walked into the worship center and the team was rehearsing and Teresa was in her flight suit holding a microphone singing. And there was like a light on her. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? It was, ooh. And I, I, I was like, I, I'm just... I said, girl, I said, best soldier I've ever seen him. I said, man, I heard, anyone ever heard love at first sight? I'd heard that before and I thought that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. But I saw her, I said, oh, girl. Mm -mm. I'll salute you the rest of my life, girl. Like, <laughs> she, she, had no, she had no clue I even existed. But man, what was attractive was the faith. Man, I love the fact that my wife is a beautiful woman, but what's incredible is the heart she has for Jesus, the life she has in Christ. And what's attractive about that is the faith, the firm foundation in what you believe in. It's just not as Christians something we talk about that looks nice on the outside. No, we truly believe it. Why? Because people are looking at you. They're seeing how you live. They're seeing how you post. They're seeing how you talk. They see how you text to see if you actually truly believe what you share. And, and I want to wrap up the series today talking about probably one of my favorite Old Testament original God followers. His name is Elijah. Now, there's Elisha. Don't be confused. Elisha followed Elijah, but this is Elijah. Elijah is one of the, uh, I mean, you, know, you wanna talk about miracles 
that came out of a prophet of God, Elijah performed some miracles. Calling down fire from heaven. I mean, listen, homeboy was such a stud, he didn't even die. Like, you know you're legit. Like, you know you are an OG. If you're just chilling and a chariot of fire with horses come down and pick you up and people are like, that was cool. Like, you know, <laughs> like, you know you're straight up OG. Yeah. Like, that's, that's Elijah. Elijah is in the New Testament. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. You've got Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. I mean, this guy is legit OG man of the faith. He had his moments. I mean, all the original OGs did. And I just gotta be honest with you. Like, they had their moments. You're gonna have your moments where the ground seems shaky. You're gonna have your moments when your back's against the wall. You're gonna have your moments where it looks like it all doesn't work out. But at the end of the day, it's not how it looks. It's how you live in your faith. You gotta trust in the fact that it may not look good now. I made him, I might have made the wrong decision then, but I'm trusting God will see it through today. And this is where our story begins. In 1 Kings chapter 16 in the Old Testament, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 16, we see God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel had many kings throughout their years, throughout their history. They would have one king that would follow God. They'd have another king that would take him away from God. They'd go through devastation, go through destruction. They'd come back to God, and they'd have a new king. You see the pattern back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And in 1 Kings chapter 16, they have a king. His name is Ahab, and King Ahab takes them away from the Lord. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that no other king in Israel's time provoked the anger of the Lord like Ahab. How'd you like that to be reputation? Nobody provoked the anger of the Lord like Ahab. Now, Ahab was a bad dude, but he married an even worse chick. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You've seen those guys, you're like, oh man, he's messed up. And with her, oh, like, you go from bad to horrible overnight. And he marries a woman by the name of Jezebel. Somebody don't know, no, no. And, and he marries Jezebel. And the Bible says that Ahab had taken Israel away from the Lord, but then Jezebel took the nation even further away, and they started worshiping idols they started worshiping this god Baal, B-A-A-L. They thought that Baal was the life source of fertility, the life source of water, the life source of crops, the life source of everything in their existence. And God, because he was so angry at Ahab and Jezebel, he sends Elijah to give them an understanding that God was the one true God. And this right here is where our, our story picks up in 1 Kings chapter 17. It says, now Elijah, who was from Tishbe in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, I wanna stop right there. Now remember I told you in 1 Kings 16, Ahab and Jezebel take the nation of Israel away from God to worship the false idol of Baal. And Elijah shows up and says, I just want to make sure that it's clear, Ahab, that the king of Israel, you, have taken the people away from the real God, which is our Lord Yahweh. It's the God that I serve. It's the God that actually lives. Baal doesn't exist. He's a fake God. He's a created God. But I want to tell you that God, the one true God of Israel, has sent me to remind you he's listening, he's alive, and he knows what's up. He says, there, for there'll be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Elijah says, because you serve a God that you think brings you sustenance, because you serve a God that you think brings you rain, because you serve a God that you think brings you life, the real God's going to show you ain't hey, nothing but a thing. So, I want to let you know, for the next few years, no dew, no rain. I think it's important to, to state that the fact that 
that Elijah says that God says, there's no dew and no, there's no refreshment at all. It's not like you go up in the morning and just be like, oh, spritzer. No. <laughs> nada. Nada. Nothing. Until I give the word. There's going to be a drought. Now, before I go on, just let's just be honest with each other. Those in the room, those joining us online, anyone ever gotten so far away from God that you experienced a drought in your life? We're just seeing physically what you and I can understand spiritually. Because we look at Ahab and go, what a dork, man. What a jerk, bro. Got so far away from God, took other people so far away from God, they experienced a drought. But y'all, we do it spiritually all the time. Some of us are in the drought right now. We came back to church today to get that refreshment because we've been missing it. (laughs) Now, the Bible says this. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth. Somebody say Kareth. That word Kareth means seasonal. I want you to go hide by the Kareth brook, the seasonal brook. It comes and it goes near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you for. Look what God's, for I have commanded. You see that? For I... What God is saying is no one else has the power to do what I'm about to do. I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped. Somebody say camped. Camped beside. Camped beside. Camped. Sean, why why are you saying that? Because the first time in my life I noticed in the scripture this week that Elijah just didn't come and go as he pleased from the refreshment of God. He camped there. You and I think that we can come and go in the anointing of God. When you know where the anointing of God is, you set up a stinking tent and a cot and you stay there. Can I? I'm gonna say it like I wanna say it. Can I say it? There is an anointing on our church. There is a blessing of God on our church. And I can say that because it's not arrogant, because it's not me, it's not Teresa, it's not you, it is God. There is an anointing of God on this church. No church in two and a half years has the impact. It is crazy. A couple hundred people since we moved come to the church. Salvation's every Sunday. Almost a thousand to Easter. But the things are a 30,000 square foot building for a church. It doesn't happen. Sean, is it you? No, I'm not that good. It's all God. And so I, I talk to people, I talk to people during the week. I say, hey, you should come to Anchor Church. Oh, I, I, I live too far away. You, really? I live a less, uh, 10 minutes away. <laughs> yo, yo, we got people that drive from Port St. Lucie. Do you know why? Because you want to camp where the anointing is. I'm telling you right now, the hand of God is on our church. You better believe I'm, in, I'm putting up tent in this place. I, 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 he camped. He camped there. Now, the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up. Doesn't it stink when the brook dries up? Anybody have those moments in your life when you're getting refreshment from the Lord, and then the stinking brook dries up? That phrase in the original language, the brook dries up, means this. God ended his appointed time. The brook dried up. 1 Kings 17. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath. It's near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. We're seeing two Stories of faith in one, Elijah the OG and a widow as well. God says, I've provided for you, Elijah. I've filled you up to go pour out. What I did for you wasn't just for you. I encouraged your faith so you could go bring faith to somebody else. 
It's just not all about you. I'm pouring into you so I can pour out of you. I'm flowing into you so I can flow out of you. I'm speaking into you so you can speak to somebody else. I'm giving to you so you can give to others, and I've instructed her to give to you. The Bible says, so he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow there gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And she was gonna get it, and he called her, but... but, um, but sir, I, I swear by the Lord, my, my God, uh, I just have one piece of bread in the house. I, I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. And I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I were gonna die. Do you understand the Lord had already spoken to her and she was out looking for sticks to make a meal for Elijah, even though she knew it'd be my last one. Now that's some faith. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. How in the world can you just say that, Elijah? Because I just spent over a year getting fed by a bird. <laughs> Go ahead and, and, and do... Do just what I said, but, but make a little bread for me first. Selfish. <laughs> then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. That's a great tithe talk right there. Give to God first and you'll be taken care of. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and always be olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. And so she did as Elijah said, and he sent Elijah and her family, and, and they, they continued to eat. Look what the Bible says, and there was always, 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 how good is it that you and I serve a God of always? I know it doesn't look like you have a lot right now, but you serve a God who always gives you provision when you need it the most. And it may not look like enough, but it's always enough. We had times in our life when we'd be tithing first and everything, and I had no idea how in the world we'd pay the bills, and somehow we always had enough. Always enough. Always enough. Always enough. And I'm gonna tell you about this story. This story is very, very personal to me, and I'm telling you why. I wanted to end with this series story because there have been times in my life when I've gone through ministry transitions, and I had no idea why in the world God was putting me through that ministry transition, and my mind would always go back to the story of Elijah with the brook dried up. Because let's be honest, y'all, we love sitting next to the brook where God's delivering us sustenance. We, we love, but, but sometimes things just happen and the brook dries up. And in, anyone ever been in a, in, a, in a drought and you felt like you were getting some provision, but then the provision dried up? Just by, by a show of hands, anyone ever felt like you've been in that drought season and, and the provision dried up? Can I tell you, it wasn't that the provision dried up, Maybe the brook dried up, but God's provision always stood strong because maybe the provision didn't come the way you wanted it to, and so you didn't think it came. It just didn't came the way you thought it would. I want to end today by talking about how you and I can have faith for God's provision. When you're in a drought, when you feel like there's just, there's, you're just, you're, you're broken, you're, 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 you're just, you're hurting you need healing, you, you, need, you need relationship, you, you, need, you, need, you need God's strength, you need forgiveness, you, you need peace, you, you're full of anxiety, and you feel like you're in a drought, can I tell you that God is the God of provision, and there will always be enough, always be enough. How, how, how can I have faith for God's provision in the middle of a drought? First of all, let's talk about provision. That is a weird biblical word, isn't it? It's just not like we don't walk around talking like that today. How you doing today, Sean? Oh, the Lord's provisions are great. <laughs> it's like we just don't talk about that. It, it, provisions are knowing God will provide when you can't. Uh, uh, there was a drought in the land. 
There's a drought. Understand for a second that how incredible it is that even though Ahab and Jezebel had led the people away from the Lord, everyone experienced the drought. Isn't it amazing that you and I could live in a godless culture and we experience the drought of other people's godlessness? You, you can be in a drought, but even though you're in the drought, God still provides for his people. Always, always. So how do you have faith in, in provision? Let me give you some practical steps here. The first is this. You gotta recognize when you're in a drought, God's timing is not your timing. Elijah sat by that brook for over a year. Lapping water, having birds, bring him bread and meat, and just receiving. <laughs> but, but the Bible says that eventually the, the, the brook dried up. Now, now look what it says in 1 Kings 17. It says, Elijah from Tishbe, uh, he says this, there'll be no dew or rain for the next few years. Now, I gotta believe, you go through a couple days where there's no rain, you're kind of like, no big deal, we've got reserves. But then what happens after a few years when you have nothing, you begin to panic a little bit. And you're going, God, what, what am I doing in this situation, God? Why, why am I not feeling it? Maybe because you're in the situation you're in because God needs you to learn something to live something. And maybe you keep going through the drought you're in because you ain't learning what you got to learn. You just want to leave. And God goes, you can't leave something until you learn something. Anybody ever gone through the same drought over and over and over again because you just can't learn? I get so mad at God and God goes, Shawnee Poo. I am not on your time schedule. And we would move along a little faster if you just learned your lesson. I remember when I was a kid and I got in trouble, I wanted my dad to spank me and get it over with. I did not want to be grounded. That was too long. I got to remember the punishment. Then we just feel it for 10 seconds and let's move on. <laughs> God is teaching us something and maybe you and I continually find ourselves stuck in the same drought because you haven't learned what you're supposed to learn. You just want to leave. You get in such a hurry to just go to what's next. You haven't figured out what you got to learn there to take with you next. Anyone ever... Uh, leave the house, rushing to the airport, rushing to work, and you get halfway and you think to yourself, did I close the garage door? <laughs> Teresa the other day texted me, she's like, I, I think, I, can you, I don't, I, I don't know if I unplug the flat iron. Can you, I've been worried about it. Though. Anybody ever, you leave in a hurry and you forget to unplug something? God is a God that is not in a hurry. I feel like some of us are in the car going, God, I'm waiting on you. Let's go. Let's go. God goes, I don't know. You'll be waiting a long time. Because <laughs> I'm just making sure everything's unplugged. I'm making sure everything's good to go. Before we jump in and go anywhere, there's just some things that you have to learn. And the reason why the drought was happening to begin with is because Ahab and Jezebel had to have a lesson on who God really was. And maybe what you're going through right now is a lesson from God showing you who he really is. Yeah. And if you and I would just learn who he actually really was, we might get through the drought a little quicker. But while you're in the drought, the cool thing is he's still bringing the provisions. He's still bringing the provisions. Wouldn't it be cool if you and I saw the drought as education and not persecution? What if you and I just thought, God, what are you trying to teach? Because maybe at the end of the day, it's not just for me. It's for the person I'm about to teach about what I'm going through. 
when you're going through a, a drought, recognize God is the God of provisions, but his time is not your time. And the other thing you gotta recognize is you gotta, you gotta understand that a lot of times God's gonna give you provisions that are unexpected and you gotta receive them when they come. A lot of times, like, can I just be honest with you? I, I really, if, if God would have asked Elijah, hey, let's take a vote, how would you like me to feed you? He would probably have not said ravens. <laughs> Anyone ever been through a drought and somebody teaches you something and it's the least person likely to teach you something? It's like not even a friend and you read a quote on Facebook, you're like, oh Lord, don't. I don't even like them. I don't even like them. Anyone ever heard a worship song in the middle of a drought and that song spoke to you like nothing else? Anyone ever heard a sermon before and it spoke to you like nothing else? God gives you refreshment in unexpected ways. Let me tell you, something. ravens are nasty. Can I tell you, how cool is it that God says, I have commanded them? Do you know why God says, I have commanded ravens? Because ravens, first of all, are bigger than crows. Ravens are gigantic. Number two, ravens are selfish. Anyone know that? They ain't sharing no food. Ravens are very, they're, they're so undependable. Remember we talked about Noah last week? You know, Noah sent out a dove. We all know the beautiful picture. The dove comes back with the green thing in the mouth. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> The land is, land is dry. We can exit the boat now. You know, the first bird Noah let out was a raven. That joker never came back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that thing gone. So undependable, selfish. Unde Do you know that ravens never go back to the same place twice? Do you also know that in Leviticus, God labeled ravens unclean, and Elijah, being a prophet of God, the last thing in the world he would have wanted to ever do is receive food from an unclean bird. And what does God say? I have commanded the thing that you would not want. I have commanded the thing that would not bring. I have commanded. How good is God that he will send someone to bring you refreshment that he's commanded them to share with you what you need at the most unlikely time for the most unlikely person? Didn't see that coming. God goes, because that was me. Which excites me when I'm going through a drought because I know if God's providing, I'm looking everywhere. You better believe when I'm going through a drought, the last thing in the world I'm gonna miss is church on a Sunday. You know why? If you're in the right place, in the right posture, you'll receive God's provision. Many of us are in the right place. We're not in the right posture. You're still ticked at God and not having a testimony for what he's doing through you. You gotta be in the right place, the right posture to receive God's provision. You gotta be engaged. People go, Sean, hey, how do you get a word on Sundays? It just come to you? No, you gotta be in the word to get a word, to share a word. Yeah. You, you get in it. You get in it and let it flow, flow out of you. You gotta recognize God's gonna give you some unexpected provision when you least see it coming. Here's the third thing. You gotta be ready going through a season of drought for the provision of God, you gotta know he's gonna bless you. You gotta know his timing is different than your time, but you gotta be ready for when he calls you for a sudden change. That's how God works. You know what God doesn't do? God doesn't go, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? You know why? Because you continue to ask God, am I ready? It, you just keep doing your thing, and eventually the Bible says the brook dried up. Okay. I think about the place we were at before we got this building. Every single, y'all, we've been in seven locations in two and a half years and grown through it with weird service times. Like weird. Sharing churches with other people, like weird stuff, but we continue to grow. And every location we've been at, God has pushed us out of. Do, do every, every location, I'm just, I'm telling you straight up. I wish I could say I'm a man of faith. I'm just telling you straight up. 
every, it wasn't me going, we need a new building. It was God going, you better get a new building. Because on my own, I was comfortable and I was content. And God goes, but I'm not. Because Anchor's got more in it than you're thinking you do. Do you know when we had to be out of Advent where we were at? They gave us, it, it wasn't their fault. We, we had three weeks notice and I got up in front of you and I was just like, I'm so excited. <laughs> God has a plan. He's got a place for us. And on the inside, I was like, oh dear God. <laughs> but just because on the inside I was freaked did not mean I didn't have faith. Because I knew. Did I think you'd be this? But here's the cool thing. Let's say we're not here a year from now. Let's say our, our, our lease is up and we're, now here's the thing, people are sending me locations and now I look at them and go, it's too small. But, but, but this, is, this, 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 this is a good sized building. It's like, I was talking to Larry this morning, he goes, we find a place, three acres, I said, too small. Because God showed us what we can do. Many of you are trying to live like this when God's wanting you to live like this. You gotta be ready to move. I, I remember when my, my, my kids were little and I would, I would, they'd take the training wheels off the bike and you, you'd ride with them. And my kids would say this, I'm ready, let go dad, I'm ready. Now I knew they weren't ready. <laughs> Just, but I'm like, okay. And they wipe out. <laughs> he wasn't ready. I said, yeah, you know. I said, and then, then they get back on, right? And I, and I go with them. And then they say this, I'm not ready. Because then they knew what happened the last time. So I'm not ready. But I, I could tell when they got their balance. Because as their dad, I'm just not going to let them wipe out again. They didn't have confidence in the balance they have because I have confidence in the balance that they have. So I would eventually, I'm not ready, dad. I let them go. And they're yelling, I'm not ready. And they're five miles away. God knows when you're ready. Stop asking if you're ready. Embrace the drought and wonder what you're supposed to learn and see it as preparation, not as persecution. And when God knows you're ready, he'll let you go. But you better be ready. You better be ready. Some of you right now, oh, I just got a prophetic word for somebody in this place. You are so stressed out, so frustrated because what you thought would come through hasn't come through. It's coming through tomorrow, so you better have some balance. You better have some, some of you girls like, I ain't found a man in 10 years. He's coming tomorrow. You better put that lipstick on tomorrow, girl. why just God 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 deliver God deliver God deliver can I tell you God's not just in the deliver business he's in the develop business he's more concerned about what he's doing in you and here's the last thing understand that the faith lesson God teaches you in the drought will be the faith lesson you teach coming out of it. You're learning right now. You're, you're, boy, y'all learning something right now to share with somebody in the future and you're gonna go, let me tell you a story. What, 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 why do I go through stuff? God, why you got me going through stuff? because I need to teach it in two years. God, why did, why did I go through that loss of a spouse? God, why did I go through the death of a job? Why? Because I need you to share with somebody else who's struggling in a year from now why you went through that. You can either pout or you can preach. It's up to you. You, you, you share what you learn. So you, you know, statistics would say 20 minutes after you leave church today, you'll forget 90% of what I said. That's encouraging. 
that's why you take notes. You're going through something difficult right now. Take some notes. God, you, I, today I saw you do this. God, I saw you do this. Come on, stand your feet. I, I got so much. Man, this series should have made it six months. But God's time is not mine. Let me close with this. Let me close with this. You, you got to have faith for the provision like Elijah did. God will give you the provision. It may not be the way you want it. It may not be the way you think it's coming. It may not be delivered in the time you want it to be delivered. But God's, he's got you. 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 You're joining us online. Just put it in the chat. He's got you. He's got you. Stop freaking out. I know it doesn't look positive tomorrow, but he's already in tomorrow. He's got you question is not, God, why am I going through this? The question is, God, what are you teaching me in the midst of it? His provision is always perfect. Let me close with this. You look in the uh, the Old Testament, right? We see Ahab, the king of Israel. Now, now, the Israelites, God's chosen people, were enslaved in Egypt 400 years, and Moses leads them out of slavery, out of Egypt. And the Bible says they're traveling to the promised land. God had a place prepared for them, the promised land. It's incredible. And, and, and God has a place. But the Bible says that there's people complaining, always complaining about what they didn't have. God brought them out of slavery. They're like, oh, I wish we were back in it. What? constant complaining and so the bible says that they were a few days away from the promised land but god made them wander in the desert for 40 years until the complainers died off and they're in the desert ain't no water in the desert no food but the provision of god sends quail the bible says at their ankles and they're just catching them up like, when the, where's these quail coming from? I don't... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> God's giving them water from a rock. I don't know if you know much about science. Water don't come from a rock. And the people drink it, and the complainers are like, oh, this water is horrible. It is bitter. Moses pff, goes wood at it, becomes sweet. Oh, Fiji. It's crazy, crazy. <laughs> Provision, 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 provision. In the places you wouldn't expect it, quail at your feet, water from a rock. Who gets water from a rock? And then the Bible says this, and God every morning sent them manna, manna from heaven. Do you know what manna means? What is this? Manna, the word manna means, what is this? They ain't never seen it before. They woke up in the morning, every single morning, they went out and gathered, gathered manna. They couldn't keep it. For the next day, God would supply new. He's teaching them every day, I am your, I am your provision. Don't hang on to it. Don't hoard it. Trust, give us this day our daily. I'm not worried about tomorrow, God. I'm just worried about the provision of today. So he gave them manna. What is this? They had no idea. It was like flakes of bread. The Bible was like little, little honey wafers. They're like, I don't know what this is. God goes, eat it. Do you know, I, I was telling Teresa, I said this week that, that uh, Jewish historians said that manna was so nutritionally perfect for the body. The body absorbed every amount of the manna. You never, you never got a stomach ache. You never went to the bathroom from it. It was fully nutritional to your body. So every ounce of it was absorbed and they were like, what is it? Just eat it. And then the Bible says this. And then after a while, they complained because they got tired and wanted variety. Y'all want diarrhea instead of a delight. Funny but don't we do it every day but God I didn't want it that way I didn't want the provision like that God goes stop being so selfish and just embrace the provision I'm giving you because it's meeting every 
single need of your soul. Just receive. God, I just receive. We're in the right place. We're in the right posture today just to receive your provision. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room, those joining us online that have gone through difficult situations. They're in a drought right now. God, would their faith be increased today as they look back in the past and see how you've brought them manna, you've brought them water, you brought them sustenance, you brought them words, you brought them encouragement, you brought them peace, and they just discounted it because it didn't come the way they wanted it to come. But today, God, you've reminded us that we have from you at all times when we just seek you and know that you're in control. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today, if you're joining us online and you're just, you're living a life of just pain. And you're living a life of pain because you've been trying to live life your way and you're figuring out it just doesn't work. You know why? Because you gotta be in the right place. You're here, the right posture. Your heart's gotta be open to receive God's love. If you're here today, you're joining us online, you've never said yes to Jesus. The Bible says that when you say yes to Jesus and you open your heart and ask him to come in, he makes everything new. Your old life is gone, you have new life in Christ. If you're in this room right now, joining us online, on the count of three, if you wanna say yes to Jesus and give him your life, I want you to be bold like you've never been bold before and raise your hand. One, two, three, just raise your hand. Yeah, raise up high so I can see it. Yeah, hands all over, yeah, yeah, awesome. Yes, yes, yeah. If you're joining us online, just, just say in the chat, I raise my hand, today's my day. Gosh, this is why we do what we do. Yeah. We're all gonna pray this prayer out loud together, but if you raised your hands in this room or online, you just say it a little bit louder because today's your day. Come on, let's all lift our hands together. Just say, dear Jesus, my heart is open to you. I want you in my life. Invade my heart, move in, change my life, forgive me of my sins, and make me a new person. And for the rest of my life, I will follow you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, Anchor, can we celebrate all those today that prayed that prayer? Those of you joining online that prayed that prayer, made that declaration, today, you're a new creation.